Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking a little time out of your day with us on this important anniversary, That's the uh, anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. My name is Steve Mills, and I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at the Climate Reality Project. Today's webinar is part of a digital day of action, so if you're tweeting along, please use hashtag ActOnClimate. Uh, for those of you who are new to climate reality, we were founded in 2006 by former Vice President Nobel Laureate Al Gore to educate a global audience about the challenges and opportunities associated with climate change. Uh, we were hoping that Samantha Langello, a Hurricane Sandy survivor from New York, would be joining us, but unfortunately, she's had a last minute conflict. Leading our webinar today, though, is our own in-house celebrity, Ryan Towell. Uh, Ryan is the climate science director on the science and solutions team here. He advises staff, partners, and volunteers on recent developments in climate science and solutions. And he's a member of the American Meteorological Society and a self-described weather geek. Uh, Ryan previously worked as a known air meteorologist and reporter in Texas and in Minnesota. Good afternoon, Ryan. Well, thank you, Steve, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, this is the two-year anniversary of Superstorm Sandy making landfall in the U.S. and obviously had a, it having a major impact on much of the East Coast of the U.S. And we're going to talk today not only about Superstorm Sandy, we're going to talk about carbon pollution and the impact it's having on our climate and extreme weather. And we're going to talk about what you can do to to really turn the tide in terms of, of continuing to pollute and, and what we can do to pre prevent those really extreme impacts of climate change. They're still preventable. There's still hope. And we want to be very clear that there is a message of hope here in today's, today's webinar. So let's start out with what's going on. Uh, this graph on the left gives you an idea of, over time throughout history, uh, carbon dioxide concentration. And the graph on the right shows you the global average temperature change. And what you see here is that carbon dioxide concentration was fairly steady up until about 150 years ago. Uh, that's the time of the Industrial Revolution, and that's when we started putting more carbon pollution in the atmosphere. And you, you can see on the graph on the right the impact that had on temperature. Temperatures have increased globally, uh, or in fact, we're nearly a degree, almost two degrees above where we were of the long-term average, and most of that temperature rise has taken place over the past century. So we see multiple lines of evidence that our world is warming. We see it through our measurements of temperature in our gauges. We see it through satellite measurements. We see it with our eyes. The temperature of the oceans, of the land, of the air is warming. We're seeing melting ice, melting land ice, melting sea ice, and we're seeing the relative humidity levels of the atmosphere increase because a warmer atmosphere is able to hold more levels of moisture, increased levels of moisture. So our world is warming, and that warming world is having a difference on the entire climate system. Weather occurring now today is much different than the weather we had even 100 years ago because our climate system is warmer and it's more moist. And it's having an impact on extreme weather. Uh, that's particularly true of heat waves, of drought, um, of flooding. We're seeing an increase in either the frequency and or the intensity of certain types of storms. So our warming world is impacting weather and extreme weather in particular. One of the things that's happening is the water cycle that you probably learned about when you were in grade school. It's intensified now in our, in our warming world. Uh, more evaporation is taking place, so the atmosphere is holding more moisture. That means storm systems have more moisture to work with, so storms are producing heavier precipitation. That could be rain or snow. And much of that precipitation, because the land can't handle that intense precipitation will run off into the sea. So it's a, it's a more intense water cycle as a result of climate change and global warming. More of our precipitation is falling in heavier events, and we're seeing that in this graph here. This shows 
uh, from the early 1900s through 2010, and you can see an increase in the days of heavy precipitation, the number of days annually in heavy precipitation. And certainly you can see that upward trend that's particularly true from the 1990s through current day. So we're warming our atmosphere, we're melting land ice, and that's causing our sea levels globally to rise. As a result, if we don't mitigate our, our carbon pollution, if we don't curb it, if we don't put into effect policies that will reduce our energy usage and carbon pollution, uh, experts, scientists expect that sea levels will continue to rise, even with successful mitigation, another one to two feet, roughly. If we continue with business as usual and continue to pollute uh, carbon pollution into the atmosphere, we could see sea levels rise anywhere between two and four feet. Some scientists think that might be too conservative, that it could very well go above four feet by the end of this century and continue rising thereafter. So obviously this is a, a major concern for so many of the folks that live in coastal areas and so much of the world's population is living in coastal areas and coastal areas continue to be developed at a really an astonishing rate. So we'll transition now into our discussion of the tropics and how carbon pollution and our climate change impacts tropical weather systems. 90% of the extra heat trapped by man-made carbon pollution goes into the oceans. So our oceans are warming. And you can see that. It's very evident here in this graph. This shows the global ocean heat content from the mid-1950s through about 2010. And there's a very distinct upward trend there. So the oceans are warming and through a fairly significant depth. This is from zero to 2,000 meters, uh, the top layer of the oceans. So let's talk about October 29th, 2012. Uh, this is the day that Sandy made landfall in New Jersey. Tropical weather systems uh, get their fuel from warm ocean waters. And this map here shows what the sea surface temperatures were like across the world on October 29th, two years ago. The reds and warmer colors there show where the waters were, the sea surface temperatures were well above normal. Uh, we'll zoom in to the east coast of the United States. You know, Sandy was a hurricane that developed in the Caribbean. It impacted parts of Cuba and then made a northward track along the east coast, parallel to the east coast. Uh, the storm traversed very warm waters. You can see there off the Carolina coast and then northward up through the northeast of New England. The temperatures were some nine degrees Fahrenheit above normal, above the long-term average. So. Sandy was moving over very warm waters in late October two years ago. Uh, Sandy was an enormous storm, unusually big, and you get a sense of that when we look at this uh, satellite image taken on the 29th. Uh, this, I think, was from early afternoon that day, so roughly about the same time as we are at seeing right now. And the center of the storm at this point was still off the New Jersey and Maryland coast. Uh, within that big blob of clouds there, you can see bright white there in the center. That's that's roughly the center of Sandy. Um, the cloud shield from the storm, just to give you a sense of how large this storm was, it goes all the way west, uh, approaching Chicago there, and then well north into Canada. So it's a large storm. And winds with Sandy, the wind field was large as well. Uh, tropical storm force winds, that's winds over 35 miles an hour, uh, extended out as much as 700, 700 miles from the center of the storm. That's a wide, wide area seeing tropical storm conditions with Sandy. Sandy obviously was an unusual storm. It was a hurricane that was transitioning into what we call an extratropical storm before it made landfall. Uh, extratropical storms are winter storms or those storms that usually move over land. So by this point, Sandy was becoming more of a nor'easter, which we see every winter, but it was an exceptionally large and exceptionally strong storm, and winds at this point were still gusting over 85 miles an hour. The damage was actually significant from Sandy. Uh, most of the damage, less from the winds, more from the storm surge. And as we go through the photographs here, you can just get a sense of how strong, how, how damaging that storm surge was. 
Over parts of New Jersey and New York, storm surge was some nine feet above normal. And unfortunately, the storm surge came in at just the wrong time because it was high tide. So, you know, we have this incredible amount of water coming through parts of New Jersey and New York and Connecticut. And obviously, lower Manhattan had extensive flooding. A uh, storm surge was over nine feet in many areas. And you can see from these images the damage it did. Uh, homes were destroyed, swept away, and the coastal areas have yet to recover from much of this damage. Uh, nearly 200 people lost their lives in Superstorm Sandy, roughly 117 in the U.S. Uh, there were other fatalities in Canada and in the Caribbean. So Stan Sandy obviously had a, just a significant impact, not only on the U.S., but also Canada and uh, surrounding nations of the Caribbean. This image is a pretty dramatic image. This shows you a, a before and after uh, in parts of New Jersey. And you can see where Sandy's surge reached parts of uh, New Jersey. It went right over the landmass, and you now there's running water there. So the storm surge was really just incredible with this storm system. And unfortunately, sea level rise played a significant role in Sandy. You know, sea levels globally are rising, and locally in New Jersey and New York, sea levels are some one foot or more higher than they were in the 19, early 1900s. So you have that sea level rise, and you put this storm surge of nine feet or more onto that sea level rise, and you have water that's moving further inland than many storms that we've seen in the past. Unfortunately, Samantha Langello was unable to uh, join us. She was going to be our guest today. But she was on our 24 Hours of Reality program last year, and she and her family are survivors of Sandy. And we're going to try to play a video here that describes what they experienced as they went through the storm. This is our old house that's currently being bought out by the government. So it's still ours for probably the next month, and then hopefully it will not be ours anymore. Remember this house? Huh? The water was up to here, up to my shoulder. And then I'm getting to the attic, and I started seeing it come up higher and higher. Eventually it came to here. And um, on the sheetrock here, I had a line saying that if it comes to there, I'm swimming out. Well, I knew I was trapping myself. I had no other choice. The only place to go was up, you know. So you thought he never was going to see us again. Yeah. You know, the Langello story is just one of, of many millions of stories, similar stories for the millions that were impacted by, by Sandy in New York and New Jersey and Connecticut. And the impacts, again, were felt over much of the east coast of the United States with uh, over 10 million without power for several days and even weeks in some instances. So obviously Sandy was a, a major storm. Uh, recovery from the storm is still ongoing. Some areas, unfortunately, may never recover. Unfortunately, Sandy isn't the only storm that we've experienced over the last several years, again, with climate change, we're seeing storms, tropical storms that are producing heavier rainfall. We're seeing storm surges that go further inland. They're higher than what we had experienced previously. And with warmer ocean waters, we're seeing these storms strengthen uh, super level storms here, super typhoon Haiyan. We're coming up on a one year anniversary of that in November. And this uh, satellite image as it was approaching the Philippines. And of course, we saw the damage there was significant. Uh, over 6,000 folks lost their lives as the storm surge and the very damaging winds. In this case, we believe that this storm was probably the strongest on record to make landfall. Sustained winds were up to 195 miles an hour at the time, so it just devastated the villages in the Philippines. The damage was just incredible. So we come back around here. We we see how 
polluting, putting carbon pollution into our atmosphere, the impacts it's having on our planet. It's warming our planet. It's leading to more moisture in the atmosphere. It's impacting our climate. It's impacting our weather. We're seeing more extreme weather the frequency and our intensity of certain events is increasing. It doesn't have to be like this. We can still act to avoid the most dire impacts of climate change. And we have to act now. We have solutions that are available to us right now. We have clean energy solutions, solar and wind and other solutions where we can move away from fossil fuels and, and the, the pollutants that that puts into the atmosphere. The price is becoming much more competitive. In fact, it's, it's equal to the price of conventional fossil fuel electricity in many countries at this point, and that's becoming increasingly the case in many other countries across the world. So we have the solutions available to us today, and we have to act. And Steve is going to tell us some of the things that you can do to – it's a call to action, really. Well, thank you, Ryan. That was amazing. Those images are so stirring, and your presentation really connects the dot for us uh, on uh, extreme weather events where we've been experiencing. And regarding solutions, I do want to encourage everyone, if you haven't had a chance, to look at uh, the Climate Reality Project's website and our 24 Hours of Reality, some extraordinary content on there recently produced. We want you also to join our Digital Day of Action. It's as easy as posting on social media uh, to honor people affected by superstorms and to share your own story and reaffirm your commitment to hashtag act on climate. We posted some images you can share uh, on our social media page, Climate Reality on Twitter and on Facebook, uh, Climate Reality. Uh, or you can share your uh, why you support limiting climate pollution from your health, your, your kids, your favorite outdoor place with hashtag outdoor act on climate. And if you're not in the social media, that's cool. Organizing for America has also has a great resource you can share with your own climate stories and read other experiences uh, at, at the link on your screen. In June last year also, for those of you in the U.S., uh, the U.S. EPA released its Clean Power Plan, the nation's first ever limits on CO2 emissions from existing power plants. Uh, that plan aims to cut emissions. Uh, it has a, in economic and public health uh, benefits that are amazing. Uh, and the plan provides the U.S. with the support it needs to take a leadership role on upcoming international conferences. So if you've already said in your comment, thank you. Uh, the next step uh, is to talk to your friends and family and your community members to do the same. We've put together a, cool, a toolkit, a cool to toolkit, doing just that. You can download it now at climaterealityproject.org uh, forward slash EPA toolkit. We'll be sending out this information in an email after the webinar uh, is over. In case you missed any of this, just check your email inboxes for the next few hours and you'll get everything you need. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Have a good day.